After preaching the good news in Derby and making many disciples, Paul and Barnabas returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch of Pisidia, where they strengthened the believers. They encouraged them to continue in the faith, reminding them that we must suffer many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Paul and Barnabas also appointed elders in every church. With prayer and fasting, they turned the elders over to the care of the Lord in whom they had put their trust. Then they traveled back through Pisidia to Pamphylia. They preached the word in Perga, then went down to Italia. Finally, they returned by ship to Antioch of Syria, where their journey had begun. The believers there had entrusted them to the grace of God to do the work they had now completed. Upon arriving in Antioch, they called the church together and reported everything God had done through them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles too. And they stayed there with the believers for a long time. Amen. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Patrice. You know, I have a confession to make. This I've made many confessions over the years to you guys. I'm I'm a bit selective about when I want to be like people that I read about in the Bible. I, I you of course, Miss Jeanette, because she's not shallow. She probably wants to be like every person in the Bible all the time. But me, I am selective. So like, for instance, um, the times we read in the Bible about like believers being persecuted, I'm not real envious of that. Do you know? I mean, I could let that one pass. I'd be totally okay, right? You know, or when they're imprisoned for their faith, I'm not envious of that one either. When, when they die for their faith, when they lose stuff that's important to them, you know, the, when they deal with homelessness or living in poverty, total dependence on God from day to day to day. It sounds cool, but I've tried it some, and I'm just not, I, I'm okay if I can pass right past that. But one of the things that I noticed that I'm especially envious of is in this passage that Brandon just read to us. I don't know if you noticed, and I don't know if you were envious of it, but it sounds really cool to me when the scripture says that the people of Jesus had accomplished what the Holy Spirit had given them to do. Because I don't know if this is your experience or not, mm. But too often when I get to Friday, the only proof that I've actually done anything is that my email box has been cleaned out. Do you know what I mean? I mean, there never seems to be a time when it's just the work is completed, you know? Because there's always more work. I mean, it seems like that's the nature of ministry. That's the nature of our life with Jesus. Right? We think in terms of there's always more people to reach. There's, there's always more things for us to think of, more creative ways to serve people, to help people, to come alongside people, to encourage people, to give hope or speak grace or talk about how amazing Jesus is or how actually easy it is to become a follower of Jesus and how hard it is to follow Jesus. I mean, all of those stuff, there's always more to be done. And so for me, I mean, sure, I at the end of most every Saturday night, I, I have one more written sermon to put in a folder that I look at from time to time. Or if, if it wasn't too terrible, I'll actually look at it on YouTube you know, later. But other than that, I don't really have any proof of the work that I do. And so when it says here that the people of Jesus, that the apostles, that they had accomplished what the Holy Spirit had given them to do, mm -hmm. wow. I just have all week thought, Man, Lord, what is that like? <laughs> Do you know? Now, don't, don't misunderstand me. Listen, I know 
that the writer in Revelation says that one day there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. I know that Jesus says in Matthew 25 that there's going to become a time that for those of us who endure it to the end, he's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. And I cannot wait for that moment. Me too. Because it's going to be awesome. And it'll be worth everything. Amen. But you know, it would be pretty cool to have just once in a while to hear, wow, you've accomplished what the Holy Spirit gave you to do. I mean, because that's, that's exactly what it says here. In Acts chapter 14, look at, look at this with me. In fact, just drop down partway through the passage to, to, to verse 26. Finally, they, and this, we're talking about, you know, Barnabas and Paul. We've been following them on their journey for the last two chapters. But finally, they returned by ship to Antioch of Syria, which, of course, that's their home church, Antioch of Syria, where their journey had begun. The believers there had entrusted them to the grace of God to do the work they had now completed. Upon arriving in Antioch, they called the church together and reported everything God had done through them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles too. And they stayed there with the believers for a long time. That second part of verse 26 the believers there had entrusted them to the grace of God to do the work they had now completed. Now, I, I know enough about this book, the, the, the Greek New Testament. I know, enough, I know enough about this book to know that, that actually Barnabas and Paul's work is not over you know, like it's time to retire or anything like that. In fact, I know that nobody in the Bible retires until they go home to be with Jesus. Amen. That's Amen. just that's just that, you Amen. know. So I'm totally I'm totally aware of that. But just for there to be this moment of clarity when the Holy Spirit of God says Yeah, that job's done. That job's complete. You did good. Now go home and tell the folks what happened. <laughs> See, here's the thing that's interesting to me too. I don't think the people, their home church, Antioch of Syria, I don't think they actually know what the work was that Paul and Barnabas were called to. See, if you look at chapter 13... Start with verse 1, and you know, sometimes they call him Paul, which is his Greek name, and sometimes they call him, or his Roman name, and sometimes they call him Saul, which is his Hebrew name, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so 13 chapter 1, when it all kicks off, it says, Among the prophets and the teachers of the church at Antioch of Syria were Barnabas, Simeon called the black man, or Niger, Lucius from Cyrene, Manan, the childhood companion of King Herod, Antipas, and Saul. One day as these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Appoint Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I have called them. So after more fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands on them and sent them on their way. Appoint Barnabas and Saul for the special work which I have called them for the special work to which I have called them. It doesn't seem to suggest that their home church knows what the work is, does it? I mean, it doesn't seem to suggest that the home church has been clued in to what's going on, what they've been called to. In fact, it doesn't even seem to suggest that Barnabas and Saul know what's going on. 
Now, lest you think I'm making this up, I don't know if you remember this or not, but one of the deacons, one of the very first deacons, a fellow named Stephen, who, who was brave and strong and really communicated effectively the gospel about Jesus and defended the faith, he had a mob come against him and uh, they gave him an opportunity to speak. They brought him before uh, the chief priests before actually it had already been planned out they were going to kill him they were going to stone him to death and they give him an opportunity to give an account for himself and he starts in chapter 7 verse 1 by saying this then the high priest asked Stephen are these accusations true about whether or not he's a heretic and this was Stephen's reply brothers and fathers listen to me our glorious God appeared to our ancestor Abraham in Mesopotamia before he settled in Haran. God told him, leave your native land and your relatives and come into the land that I will show you. So Abraham left the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran until his father died. Then God brought him here to the land where you now live. Now, Stephen, when he says this, he's making reference to Genesis chapter 12, right? Mm -hmm. But you can also read a little bit about this in, in Hebrews chapter 11, what we refer to as the faith chapter. And what you can get between this in Acts chapter 7 and Genesis chapter 12 and Hebrews chapter 11 is that God does not give Abraham the details to the plan. Amen. He just says, hey, come with me. I'll, uh, I'll tell you as we go. Mm. Mm. That, because of that, and because of that happening several times in the scripture, I kind of believe that the home church in Antioch of Syria, they didn't know what the mission was. And Barnabas and Saul, soon to be known as Paul, he didn't know what the mission was either. All they knew was Acts chapter 13, appoint Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I've called them. And then chapter 14, verse 26, B. The believers there had entrusted them to the grace of God to do the work they had now completed. Now listen, here's just two or three things real quick I wanna, I wanna just point out about this part, okay? The first thing so far that I've gotten from this is that when God calls you, he rarely gives you the whole plan. Mm -hmm. And sometimes he doesn't give you anything more than the first step he doesn't even give a large part of the plan. When God calls you, you have to step out and obey, and then he'll tell you what the next step is, and the step after that, and the step after that. I remember in seminary, they used to ask me on a regular basis what I was gonna do when I got out of seminary, and I said, I don't know. And they're like, what do you mean? Are you gonna you gonna be a pastor? You're gonna become a professor? You're good at Greek. What do you what do you what are you gonna do? And I would say, not a clue. And they say, how could you have no clue? I just he told me to come here, and so I came. <laughs> and I'm studying, and I hope that by the time I get done, you can ask Barbara. I hope by the time I get done, he tells us what to do next, because. Because we'll be stuck. Yes. That's how he's always worked with me. The reason he's always worked that way with me is because I just don't have enough faith for him to lay out this huge plan. Because I'll be overwhelmed by it, and I'll just quit and run home. And so he just says, hey, why don't you do that? Yes, sir. 
Sometimes I say yes, sir. <laughs> Sometimes I argue with him. But you know. He wins. So, yes, yes, he always wins. That's absolutely <laughs> right. But then the second thing to notice is not only does he not give you the whole plan, but secondly, that means that only the Holy Spirit will tell you when that work is complete. Mm -hmm. Now, there are times when specific missions you have been given are accomplished, and not only will the Holy Spirit tell you it's completed, but maybe your home church will affirm it for you. But if God's called you to the mission, then here's the deal. There's no group of people in the world who can convince you it's done if you've not heard the person who called you say, hey, good job, that's completed. Now let's go on to what's next. And then the third thing is that the leaders of the church in Antioch of Syria, they laid their hands on Paul and Barnabas and sent them out with their blessings. And when they returned, we're reminded that the believers entrusted them to the grace of God to do the work. The blessing of the church in going and the affirmation of the grace of God through the work of the church upon completion were essential. I was having a conversation with a fellow earlier who, who was telling me about his ministry. And, um, and when I asked what church he was part of, uh, he, he said he didn't have church. Did, he, he did what he did on his own. And I, I wasn't going to argue with him because I was just didn't know the man. But you can't find that in the scripture. Mm -hmm. There are no spiritual lone rangers. That's the reason that the church that you're part of, your local church, your home church, your community of faith, that's why they send you out with God's blessing and why they receive you back with the affirmation of God's grace. It's so that you never think that you are on your own. Somebody has your back. Amen. So in response to this welcome home and affirmation of their work and faithfulness, Barnabas called the church together and report on their journey. Now, depending on who you talk to, because there are a lot of smart guys out there and girls, and they've got opinions on on uh, how long the trip took, but probably three years. You know, Gustavo Guterres, who is way, way smarter than me and an amazing historian, he says four years. There's some guy who I know has never pastored a day in his life, he says one year. He doesn't really know how long stuff takes. I could just <laughs> tell, you know. And so, anyway, I'm just going, I'm, but, but uh, Craig Keener, Dr. Craig Keener, he says three years. So somewhere between three and four years. That's what I reckon, okay? That's, that's just what I'm going with, all right? So three and four years they've been gone. Well, you know that they didn't just call everybody together and have a 30-minute conversation about what they did on their summer vacation, you know? I mean, they covered a lot of ground. There was a lot of conversation that took place. There were a lot of stories being told. I mean, back in the day, 50 years ago, when I was seven, <laughs> and Coach was eight, <laughs> about 50 years ago, did I get that right? Yeah, okay, I just wanted to make certain. So back in the day, about 50 years ago, we went for a little while. We went to this fundamentalist Baptist church in Indianapolis, my folks and my brothers and I. And it was, uh, it, it was in a pretty rough neighborhood. I, um, I got, t I, one day, one evening when I was there do, <coughs> doing this young people's thing, I was like in sixth grade, I got... I got sucker punched by this guy coming across the parking lot. And I don't know what was more humiliating 
that I got sucker punched or that it was in the, a church parking lot <laughs> when it took place. But anyway, it's a, it's a pretty rough neighborhood. And um, what I remember about it was there just there were some strange moments. Um, we uh, we talked about how evil the Beatles were, and um, and communism. And um, gosh, I don't remember. You, you know, like high cholesterol foods. I you know there was all this stuff that we were against. You know. And, and the only thing that I do remember uh, was that, uh, um, oh, yeah, 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 Henry Kissinger was the Antichrist. I remember that. <laughs> but he, the, the one thing that I do remember was that from time to time, because the church was committed to having missionaries, they had their own missionaries who came from the church. It was kind of a, it was actually kind of in later years, I came to realize that was a pretty, pretty cool deal. But they would they would arrange a time, uh, never on a Sunday morning, but normally like on a Wednesday night or a Sunday night, and the missionary that we supported would come wearing some sort of whatever garb that would be representative of the country they they are from, right? And at some point in time, and, and there'd be like knickknacks on the table so you could see what a real tambourine look like and bongos and clay pitcher and stuff, right? And then at some point in time, while they were talking about the work, they would have a slideshow. Now, some of you, some of you will not remember or know what a slideshow is. <laughs> it's, um, it's like PowerPoint, but less efficient, effective, <laughs> and with less clarity, all right? And there'll always be one slide that gets stuck, and you get to see it like six times, and sometimes, you, you know what I'm talking about, right? He, here was the thing that made me a little bit crazy later on when I became a follower of Jesus, and I realized what was going on. It was one of the most boring evenings I could spend in that church building. It was just flat out grueling. How boring was it? <laughs> well, you got to wonder, though, how can you take something as exciting as living your life in another country with another culture and another language and all of the challenges that come with that as you start a church and lead people to Jesus and help them form so they gain their own momentum and then go from that to starting another church and another church and an how can you make that boring? But at the time, that's what I remember. I remember it was boring. And it's not because, well, I mean, I did have ADHD, but that wasn't totally why I was bored. So when I think about these guys telling all these stories about what happened for three and a half years of their life, I need you to know that it wasn't one of these boring meetings where we talked about how much money was spent or how many people were spoken to or how many people we actually baptized or how many whatever, whatever we counted at the time. That's not what took place. When Barnabas and Paul, when they came back, they they told stories that would have kept people on the edge of their seat. And the reason I know that is because these people, their home church, were engaged. Their home church was committed. They were praying for those guys every day. They didn't have any clue when they were going to come back. And they prayed for them every day. I'm convinced of that because that's how they sent them off. They sent them off by praying and fasting for them. And they heard the Holy Spirit speak while they were worshiping and praying and fasting. It wasn't a special moment in the life of the church. 
It was just another day for them praying and fasting and worshiping the Lord. And so it mattered to them when they came back. You got to remember that these two guys, these two guys were two of the main leaders of this church. Imagine having five pastors and your most senior pastor, who would be Barnabas, and your least senior pastor, who would be Paul, all of a sudden leave. And they say, we'll be back. And you don't really know where they're going or why they're going or anything else except the other leaders said the Holy Spirit told them they need to go. We need to pray for them. Now, of course, they get information coming back to them. They're not totally blind about what's going on. But then three years later, they rock back up. Who in that church isn't going to be interested? Yeah. And here's the beauty of it. This is the part I love. Upon arriving in Antioch, they called the church together and reported everything God had done through them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles too. Upon arriving in Antioch. They called the church together and reported everything God had done through them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. See, the what I figure is that because sometimes we have a tendency to become competitive, you know, kind of do a one-upsmanship, not even really when we mean it. We don't even mean to, but we do. We have this tendency. And so that, so that people wouldn't doubt their sincerity, so that people wouldn't make a mistake of thinking that they were bragging, they made it clear that it was... It was God through them. They made it clear that it was God who opened the door for the Gentiles. You know? You can just picture them telling the story about Lystra. And, you know, uh, Paul saying it, it was crazy because God healed this guy. And then the next thing you know, that... The, the people thought I was Zeus and he was Hermes. And then Barnabas interrupts and says, no, no, I was Zeus, you were Hermes. <laughs> and then Paul says, I don't remember that one very clearly because I got a couple of rocks to the head, you know. But, you, but it was amazing because there are people who, who were led to Jesus even as people were throwing rocks at me. You know, or when they went on to Derby and, you know, where Paul should have been was an ICU. And Barnabas says, so I'm trying to take care of Paul. You guys can imagine this. I'm trying to take care of Paul and I'm talking about Jesus. And believe it or not, while I'm doing both things at the same time, I just want you to know a whole lot of people became followers of Jesus because of what God did in their lives. And then the craziest thing of all, the Holy Spirit, instead of letting us come straight home because he really needed a doctor, we went back through all of the places where the churches had been established. We went back through every place where there had been persecution and we had been run out of town and there had been mobs and God protected us and God had, you will not believe this, God had established a church in each See, they were so clear about it being God that nobody thought they were bragging. Amen. Amen. Nobody. Yay, God. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes I think the reason that we don't talk more 
about how God has used us is because we're afraid we'll be judged. That someone won't mm. think that we're being arrogant. Instead of us just being able to say, man, God opened up this door for me to have this spiritual conversation with this fellow, and it was unbelievable. It was just unbelievable. I don't even know what I was saying. And the guy was all over the place. And the next thing I know, he says, I, yeah, I want to come, I want to come meet your church family. See, we should be able to do that, right? Mm -hmm. Don't get me wrong. I haven't seen or heard any of you guys do that sort of thing. Okay, so don't... I'm not, you know, pointing anybody out. But what I'm saying is maybe the reason that we are so hesitant, at least one of the reasons, we are so hesitant when we're together to talk about that moment where Jesus said yes and amen is because we're afraid we'll come off as super spiritual or I'm talking about myself again or whatever. Listen, here's the deal. Everybody in this room knows that if something significant happens with you, with another person, regard to the, the Holy Spirit or the Lord Jesus Christ, that it had a whole lot to do with God and very little to do with Amen. you. Amen. Just relax. Amen. All right? Yeah. <laughs> See, we're going to get chances. We're going to get opportunities to practice that. But let me just give you a couple of examples, all right? Let me just, just, just for a minute, okay? Would you think for a minute, all right? Maybe something God said to you this week that just was especially meaningful. Or a way that God specifically used you this week to support or encourage or build up or an opportunity you had to serve somebody else. Just think for a moment, okay? Okay. 